<laughs> oh my god well you know you know on the side they have this fine print which you can't even read by the way you know and it, it, down there it's like you know make sure you use it in well ventilated area and i'm sure you're starting to feel dizzy and slightly it loopy was, and... it was a little rough yeah i opened all the windows and doors and oh my um, gosh. it uh so i know that now but that's <laughs> no that unfortunately that's my diy experience like ah that would be helpful next time. Okay, plus spray paint. Like, you mean like the ball in the can? Yeah, yeah, shake cry it up. Long, cry Dude, white. that's that's pretty gutsy to use inside because that stuff goes everywhere. Is it? <laughs> I mean, unless you're taping and like almost plastic. I, I just need a little spot. They're oh, just... okay. I figure like you're spray painting your whole wall. I'm like, they make paint the sprayers no. for this. No, it's I... just, it just a few spots, but, but it's still, it, it, uh, it's pretty volatile stuff. Uh huh. Well, so I was thinking back to Jason Poole about a year ago. He was doing a live design, and he was talking about some projects, and he's and and he's talking about his paint booth, uh, booth, and it's like a cardboard box with a box fan blowing over it. And I had asked him like, "Hey, what's your ventilation?" Um, and he's like, um, "Whatever he said, like box fan two thousand or yeah. Harbor Breeze or something." And it was hilarious. I'm like, "Oh," because I was really thinking hard about all this stuff I'm going to be doing in my basement having the shop and doing the, the whole floor, like I want some ventilation um, that's not just opening the one basement window. And so I started really thinking about it and ended up, I don't know if you can see the, the thumbnail, but there's a picture of me during this renovation with like a 10 inch, um, you know, basically oversized dryer exhaust duct and set that up with like a thousand CFM exhaust fan. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was awesome. Cause I ended up doing, a bunch of stuff down here that, uh, yeah, if I don't ventilate it, where's it going to go? I like osmosis up the floor into the, <laughs> you know, the, the house. So mm. yeah, ventilation is key. And I guess that's the problem with the, the basement shops. And if you go on YouTube, I mean, it's a whole rat hole about, you know, dust collectors and shop yeah. facts and what people have set up in order to deal with this with their home shops. And I'm like, I had no appreciation for this, but obviously with woodworking, that makes a lot of sense. It's all the fine dust. Yeah. You got to make sure you're, you're taking out somewhere. So what do you have set up, Brad, in your, uh, you got your shop there. Is that garage level? You can open the door. How do you ventilate? Yeah. Uh, garage level, you know, out, out of my line of sight, I'm looking at my garage doors here. This is kind of a nice little workbench area where I can keep all my tools. Cause you know, I'm a big DIYer. Huge. I mean, all you're talking about is all the, uh, giant DIYs you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I own. I, I noticed you came in the flannel today. That was a oh, that was a coincidence, you, right? Well, you said let's go to our shops, and I saw a chat here. Are we in the same same shop? Uh, no. <laughs> As you can tell, I have a much better omni wall pegboard. Brad is the old round hole pegboard. I mean, come on. Yeah, but yep. we decided, hey, we're going to talk about um, a few DIY projects and how they pertain to multi body modeling, and we're going to learn a lot about SolidWorks. Just talk shop. And of course, you got to be wearing flannel, tis the season, especially yeah. in the shop, because it is actually cold in my basement right well, now. Tool talk, tool talk. I see you have some pretty loyal to uh, the red. Is that Harbor Freight, the red oh. power for Harbor Freight? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, no, it's Target, actually, Target brand. No, I'm mostly Milwaukee. You uh -huh. know, when we moved into our house like three years ago, I, I started doing all these DIY things, and, and pretty soon I got really good at buying tools over at the uh, big orange store. Yep. And then I figure it's nice to have the same series because then I have like four chargers. I got a bunch of the batteries, but man, yeah, these Milwaukee tools, just awesome. And I don't know why I chose them. I know it's kind of like a Ford, Chevy, Coke, Pepsi <laughs> thing other than, hey, I'm in Illinois. My wife's from Wisconsin. Like, I feel like I'm supporting Wisconsin. And I know they are. <laughs> they're based in there and some of their design work. Of course, they're yeah. manufactured overseas. But yeah, man, I love them. What about you? Do you have a, a um, brand loyalty? You know, I kind of mix. I kind of mix. Maybe if you're in the chat, tell us uh, what your tool platforms are too. That's kind of fun, fun discussion. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a super big DIYer. I just I'm just kind of a home use type person. So I really like uh, Black and Decker. Um, I have quite a bit of Harbor Freight stuff, which I find to be really good value. It works great yeah. for me. Uh, yeah. My favorite tool probably is the the uh, cordless multi multi tool i can't see your screen uh like an oscillating tool or yeah what the is cordless it? oscillator is yes. pretty great um oh my gosh and yes. then what else have i been buying i buy uh 
the works brand tools are really good too for me. I have a lot of yard tools like blowers and blower backs and, and you can't beat the name. Yep. W O R X <laughs> though. So uh, we should that's why we couldn't do that. That would have been so much more edgy. Works. Yeah. What do we got here? We got oh some Bosch. Yeah, definitely Bosch Dewalt. That's what I would buy if I were if I were a big time project guy okay. like, like like Sandy and Yep. Yeah, shoot. Oh, Sean. Yeah, Sean's the Bosch person. I like the show, Bosch. You and I, we definitely like that show. Yeah, Bosch. That's something, that's something else. Um, that's for our podcast. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Hey, by the way, I got, after yesterday, we are talking about eggnog and coffee. So I, I put eggnog in my coffee, but it, like, sunk to the bottom. So I haven't even got to eggnog yet. But That man, seems like a good idea until you try it. And then the coagulation coefficients or the viscosity or some other engineering term insert here immiscibility immiscibility maybe that's it we've got immiscibility matrix yes probably, come on probably in the chat can tell us exactly what's going all right on. do we have to get do hey, we have to get going yet we should probably kick this off um, <laughs> great so hey everybody thanks for joining uh solidworks live design i believe this is going to be our last episode of live design for the for the end of the year so uh, jingle bells jingle bells but we are here with Brian Zayas, and uh, we're going to talk about multi-body, not modeling, but remodeling, <laughs> because, you know, I think uh, it's pretty universal for SolidWorks users uh, who also do some home projects that there's just this natural connection between using CAD to help with your design and help assist with um, laying things out, maybe material uh, purchasing, and um, you could even go so far probably as to to design a system and create a cut list and go to the store and get your uh, get all your stuff. Uh, yeah. I think there's right. Brian. I think that you have um, you have quite a few tips and quite a few discoveries that you've made in some of your home projects that you're going to share with us today, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, more than anything, I want to give everyone watching the perspective, and and it's something we've talked about a lot on live design over the last couple of years. Is I don't say versus, but assembly modeling in context versus multi-body, especially as it pertains to master modeling. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna get into that topic, but we're gonna touch on some things that'll help you all understand, hey, how how should I approach this? Because if there's one theme of SolidWorks is that there's no right answer, there's a lot of pretty good way answers to get what you wanna do. And to your point, Brad, why, why do we even CAD things up and how far do we go in CAD is something I've really learned to appreciate as, as a DIYer. So yeah, I'm excited to share some perspective on that, uh, but yeah, in my studio with my brand new workbench uh, from earlier this year, and it's kind of a funny story, you know. I actually let me back up a sec, and I want to preface everything I show you by saying I'm not a carpenter, and so I use a lot of fasteners, which is great because I'll get to show a lot of different hole wizards, and we can make some hole tables and all that. Um, but I did get into uh, a couple years ago. I uh, had to redo part of my roof, hired this carpenter, and he's like, "Hey." You want to help me with this? You know, I won't charge you as much, but you can be my uh, assistant. I'm like, oh, dude, that sounds awesome. I don't know if it's legal, but uh, cool. And I actually learned a ton from him, and it got me really confident. Okay, like, I could do this. I could do some some framing, especially because you hide it. You don't see it. Uh, so we did that project. We redid our basement on the top right there. That was our uh, quarantine project during COVID. Turned out great. And then most recently, just last month, finished um, doing our master bathroom on the bottom right there. And actually did had to build a whole new uh wall on there and a lot of framing but in each one of these even the project today i learned how much you want to do in cad so i have some cad models i'll show you as we kick off uh but here was the project for today and really the beginning of this year on the left hand side do any of you know what those floor tiles are if you see on the bottom left, those almost reminds you of like elementary school. Uh, but those are the old like nine inch by nine inch asbestos, asbestos uh, vinyl tiles. So, mm -hmm. so uh, one of the big things we wanted to do in this house was somehow uh, mitigate that. And you have several options. You know, you could pay a lot of money to have them removed and scraped up. And uh, didn't really want to do that. So I decided I want to cover them up, you know, kind of encapsulate them, if you will. And I wanted to do one of these really nice flake floors you see in garages and shops sometimes on the right. Um, so, so like, okay, that's going to be pretty easy. I'll measure the floor. And this all started as I just want to do the basement floor. And here's actually what this looked like, this corner I'm in before I built the bench. 
Uh, and I, what I realized really quickly is I have so much uh, stuff, so much tools. I need to build a bench. So I'm like, hey, I need to redo my basement floor. I better start with a new workbench. <laughs> and I'm sure you all know how these projects go or it has nothing to do with it. But you start to do the project and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, I need to take a little side trip. Um, talk to my wife. As you all talk to our partners and our stakeholders in our households, project extension approved. Uh, but she was like, you know, keep it keep it short. Like you, you said you're gonna get that floor done. I had everything moved out, the washer, the dryer and all that. So I didn't have all day. So at first I was thinking, OK, I, I, this is going to take a day. Right. Um, I just I repainted, reprimed the walls. Looks OK already. Looks a lot better. Painter's tape, mocked up, I want to build some cubbies, here's where I want to have my workbench. Super simple. And I really was very close to just skipping CAD altogether. Because like I said, I want to get this done in a day. How hard is it going to be? Like maybe just drill in some ledger boards, start putting down a, um, a workbench. I'm thinking, we got no time for CAD, Dr. Jones. we got to get this done. By the way, did you see the new uh, Indiana Jones 5 trailer? I haven't seen this trailer yet. but oh, it's good. I, I'm holding out high hopes. Okay. Okay. So I had all this wood. I'm like, yeah, I, I should just start building. And I was so tempted. And, and, and I'm looking back, and I'm so glad I didn't just start building. But I'm wondering in the chat, if you guys had a project like this, would you just kind of design while you build while you design? I mean, we all kind of do that sometimes, just start building yeah. it and you have an idea. But I didn't really have enough experience to be able to pull from that library. So ultimately, I'm like, okay, let me just CAD this up. But can I afford to spend time? And how much time do I spend in, in CAD? And so I'm starting to think about the requirements, the like to have. Uh, and I'm thinking, okay, first of all, it's a day trip, not a new expedition. This is not the main purpose of this project. I do need it to integrate to the existing wall, which at first I was thinking was pretty easy. And you probably can't tell, but on this wall, there's a bunch of, uh, I would say, flashing from when they poured it. Obviously, they, you know, when they poured this in the 50s, they had some wood molds and there's concrete sticking out so i'm like oh wow i need to work around that i can't just put up a flat ledger board it's not going to sit level uh pitch wise or roll wise so i need to integrate it i uh wanted to make sure it was safe because i'm going to hang it on the wall and that was one of the big things I'm like i really want one of these wall mounted so watching these youtube videos i want a wall mounted workbench and again to go back to the idea of getting everything off the floor uh, so i could do the floor yeah, wall mounted. So what is the safety factor? And not so much the wood itself. I mean, guys, I have like two by tens, two by sixes. I mean, this thing is beefy, but the fasteners I was going to use, especially sinking it into the wall, how is I going to be on those allowables? So I'm like, okay, CAD would actually be really important just to validate this. Uh, and then nice to have, hey, visual, can I do a walkthrough, get some partner validation? And like we were talking about a little bit, sometimes you do want to get to the point of having a cut list, a bill of material. And in my case, I really did want to just go once down to the depot, although it's only 10 minutes away. And this project wasn't a one tripper, that's for sure. But that, and then of course, fasteners. Um, I'm sure we've all stood in the fastener aisle at the depot and just, and then you're thinking in your head, okay, I'm probably going to need some of these, but I don't know if I need the two inch, the two and a half, so I'll buy both. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want to go there and just buy all the right fasteners. And that was one thing I was able to get out of this um, as a deliverable. Not only that, what when it came time to doing it and doing it efficiently, I wanted to make all the cuts at one time. I didn't want to be sitting here cutting, fitting. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I could get to the point of having a cut, uh, a dimension cut drawing, and then also having some templates. And this is one thing I really liked. I hadn't really done this in a project before, but this is a template uh, for the back of one of these arms. And it was really nice because, again, I'm not a carpenter, so I bet a lot of you are going to have some better ways of how you would fasten this. But I used a lot of fasteners, which uh, is great. But also, so were means, those Brian, were those just one to one prints, or did one you one to one prints? Five? So I'm going to I'm going to show you how to get there. So I'm going to actually stop Ooh, talking. Okay. Okay. Uh, so how much detail? So let me flip over to SolidWorks. So this is this is how I started this whole project. Was hey, I'm going to do this epoxy floor. Uh, let's just do a quick measurement and see what kind of surface area I have. And we'll set up our units it to be in inches, actually feet. You know, when I bought the epoxy, they wanted square feet, like 184, let's call it 200 square feet, right? And then I realized, oh man, I need a lot more. So I created a floor plan and then I started to get into uh, the design. But I want to show you some of those other designs real quick, just for the sake of showing you different levels of detail. Mm -hmm. So for this project today, I just stayed in one part the whole time. 
Now, when I redid the finished side, that actually became a pretty large assembly. And the reason being is, well, I had some complex patterning. I had a lot of different components that were either uh, downloaded from the vendors, like this uh, faucet we put in for the wet bar, uh, some of these shelves I was able to pull from their websites. But really, more than anything, assembly versus multi-body, and we set it on a few of the other live designs, whether it was with Mike Sandy and Jordan or, or with Caleb or, or Mark Peterson. When you use assembly or multi-body, mm, it, it's a blurry line, but one of the big things in the assembly is you can have mates uh, that you can drive. And so, for example, if I'm playing around with where my offset is going to be on one of these floor planks and I have a mate driving that, I'll be able to kind of drag it and see how changing the first row uh, height and width is going to affect the downstream transitions. You know, assembly makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So in this one, I took a lot of time and put in a lot of detail. When I did my bathroom, likewise, it was a pretty sloppy assembly model. And I really didn't use this for much other than counting how many tiles I needed to buy because – when you get into the situation of actually doing the bathroom, you pretty soon just leave the CAD model behind and you're measuring and cutting everything to fit the actual situation, especially in a 1953 house. Uh, but in this one, I wanted to have just enough detail to get to the point of having this template drawing, uh, of having a detailed drawing here that I could uh, cut from. Of course, I closed that version. Uh, all right, so let's get into a little bit of how I decided that. So assembly or multi-body part. Again, today you're going to get a perspective on that. So what was the basis of the design I'm working on? It's a lot of extruded blocks, two by sixes, you know, some three quarter inch plywood, two by fours. I don't need parts for that. In fact, it's going to hinder me if I try and do that at the assembly level because I'm going to be what inserting new parts, trying to edit in context. I want to move quick, so I'm just going to be able to make blocks. And I'm going to be deleting some things, recreating ideas. Yes. So both of those reasons, I'm like, I want to be in the part world, be more nimble. Um, do I need part numbers for each of these components? No. Am I going to release this? No. Do I have complex patterns? No. Uh, do I need to divide the work and share parts? You know, like Caleb talked about with the master model technique. Uh, I don't need to do that. So all of those reasons, I'm like, part is fine. Um, how do I feel about in-context assembly references? Okay, I'm fine with that but I'll avoid them if I, if I can. Uh, do I need to create isolated explode views? Yes, and you can do that with multi-body drawings. How complex are the references? Very simple. Sketches, yes. And probably the last question is the most important thing when you think about, hey, do I really want to approach this from an assembly or a, a multi-body part perspective is, are, are there going to be components that move around? Uh, I want to be sliding around. You know, like Jordan, when he remodeled his house, he had cabinets that were magnetically mated, and he's laying out the whole concept for the kitchen. Like, I'm not doing that. I'm just making some blocks. So I just need one part to do all this. But the only way you're going to be able to do that is to be really proficient at multi-body modeling. Uh, one of the things Jordan talked about in his live stream was the difference between multi-bodies and, and assemblies. And he made a really good point. It's like, it's kind of a blurry line. Besides the thing about assembly mates in motion, it's a very blurry line because over the last, well, 20 years, the SolidWorks R&D team has done a great job uh, adding things into multi-body modeling. You think about uh, last year we had cut lists being available in bills and materials. You know, a few years before that, things like interference detection and exploded views. I guess those are more like six, seven years ago now. But a lot of things that you really want to be able to do. Uh, tab to hide bodies. So a lot of things we'll talk about today. Real quick, Brad, I want to talk about uh, some of the other live design episodes because I'm definitely not the first one to talk about multi-body especially, and I'm not even going to talk about master modeling, but multi-body is such a key thing that I wanted to put together a quick playlist. And so Ian on the back end, he's going to make a playlist for me and we'll, we'll make it just for this topic. And this is the order in which I would watch them, right? I would start with Mark Peterson, who talks about master modeling and in the multi-body environment, how you have uh, different capabilities and how you split the bodies out. Uh, he gave some real good basics on, on navigation from that, I would move into Caleb's live design from a few weeks ago where he talked about master modeling and got really into what is the best approach to split the bodies out. I would then watch Mike Sandy. He built a desk, but he did it with assembly level um, in context references and weldments. And I'm not going to do any of that today because I didn't need to do that. Although weldments are amazing, especially if you get to the level of like Jordan Tadich on the bottom. He's reframing all the all the rafters or the joists in his ceiling and building a deck you want weldments. And so I would actually watch that one last. Um, but he has a bunch of downloads, templates, 
uh, Weldman profiles that you can grab and get to a real point of, of proficiency. So the goal for today, I'm, I'm watching all these. And I'm thinking, what can I add? Well, I think what I can add is the first video to this playlist, right? What are the essentials you need to know before you can even really appreciate these? So it's going to be simple, but I think it's going to be uh, impactful. And I hope that you guys get a lot get a lot out of this. So the topics I hope to cover today, what is multi-body? Multi-body versus assembly. We already talked about that a little bit. Whole wizard, feature scope, convert and offset, navigating the bodies folder, delete and keep bodies, drawings, walkthrough, and simulation. So a lot to get through. And again, you guys might look at this like, that's pretty simple. But if it's simple to you, great. Enjoy it. And if you're new to multi-body or whatever that is, you're going to learn learn a lot. Does that sound good, Brad? Yeah, I think that's a great start. Um, boy, lots of topics to cover here. All right, so I'm going to go fast. You keep me let's, on track. Yeah, let's, let's see where you're going to start. I just want to say real quick, because no one actually talks about what multi-body is. So I'm just going to make a multi-body part, and there I'm done. Live design's over. Back to my nog. Oh. All of a sudden, you notice I have a solid bodies folder, and there's two different items. So those right there are the multi-body. So when we say multi-body part, all we're saying is it's multiple distinct closed watertight 3D solids. So if you have a disconnected sketch, you extrude them, it's creating two bodies. So that's it. That's multi-body um, in a nutshell. Now, the thing is, let's say you sketch a little feature here. We'll make an extrude that could bridge those together. Okay, what's going to happen, Brad, when I hit OK? Is it going to be three bodies? Is it going to be one body? What do you think? Um, this is going to be one. This is the merge it, yep. result. Merge result. Yeah. So, again, very basic, but something we didn't touch on in all those playlists was, hey, this is a very key checkbox that's kind of nestled in there. Um, and you got to watch it. So merge result is on, which means it's going to merge the 3D volumes. And since they're continuous, it's merged them and now it's one body. OK, yeah. So the first thing I would recommend is everyone really get comfortable, you know, thinking about solid bodies folder. It's almost like your component list in multi-body. And one, one thing I always do, Brad, is I customize my tree items. So hide show tree items, if you just right click there on your bodies folder, and I always show, and sorry, let me zoom in. I know I'm kind of small here. I'm always going to be showing uh, solid bodies. I'm going to set this to show and <laughs> surface bodies set this to show. Yeah, because when they're on automatic, they they don't show up until there's multiple. Actually, yeah, until you actually need them. And this is this can be confusing, too, because. That's right. Uh, some of you may be watching this going, hey, my tree doesn't look like that. Uh, so I set those to show. I'll always have them there. I, even if I have one, I want to know that I, I have one. So let's go back real quick. Again, I know this is basic, but you guys, you know how, if you know about this, you know how important it is. And I swear that when you started SolidWorks for the first several months or maybe years, you really didn't know how this worked. So I'm going to go back. Yeah. Edited, I edited that boss extrude. Let's unmerge it. Okay. okay, so now that feature is not going to merge, and now I have three bodies. Yeah, so it's almost like three parts now. I right? have my three because... blocks blocks of wood. Now Can let's I start a new those? sketch. Say it again. Can I rename those bodies? You can rename them. Uh, notice, hold on, let me finish this and let me touch on that, because that's actually a good, good question. All right. If I extrude another one, deselect merge result, four bodies, and this is where you got to be careful, and this is something that um, I know we'll get comments on this already, but check this out. I'll make another little boss. Merge result is back on. So do you know how to automate keeping that turned off? Mm, I don't think I do. Well, it's not sticky. And I think that's been a long-standing enhancement is, you know, have a toggle. But what a lot of us do, uh, what folks like Jordan showed us, are you can actually turn on the weldment feature. I'm not going to do that for this. But if you turn on weldment, even though you're not making a weldment in the traditional structural steel sense, it will keep that box turned off for you. So a little uh, shortcut a lot of us. Oh, have. okay. Because it's more like a default behavior then. Because when default. you're in weldments, mm -hmm. you mostly want them to not be merged. Correct. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but that's that's a little tip. And in a lot of cases, I will turn that on. And in the other model, we'll get there. We'll make a cut list. Although, actually, no, we probably won't have time for that. 
And besides, Jordan covered cut list really well. But if your end goal is, hey, I want a cut list, meaning I want a list of each member with the length, the miter angle, uh, yes, you would you would turn that on. But let me go back to your question about naming, because notice each body. Now, how is it picking up that name? Same as the feature name, right? Yeah. So if I rename the feature, so boss extrude three, this is my uh, king block. I don't even know what I'm making here. Notice to rename the body. Nice. Now I can rename the body. Let's say this is, no, this is the queen block. Doesn't rename the feature. Okay, so what if I operate on this and let's say I make a quick cut. It's going to make an extrude cut one feature, right? So guess what it's going to do? Ah, sometimes it'll rename that. Anyway, so you can rename mm -hmm. the feature. You can rename the body. Now, what Caleb mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I highly recommend is you wait until you've really done your model before you rename stuff, or else uh, new features could rename it, and you just you don't want to have to deal with with that until uh, the end. So I, I would rename this all at the end. But then it's very helpful, especially if you're going to make a Weldman cut list. You want to have the bodies uh, named, or use this downstream. You know, you, you want to know what bodies what. Yeah. Uh, so the last thing I want to do in here, just again, fundamentals. I have four bodies. Uh, if I want to add them all together, that's where Boolean operations come in through the combine feature. Um, so let's say I've done multi-body, but now I'm ready to commit this to one solid block. And that's where uh, you can do a combine add. And it'll add if you can, kind of like merge all the results together. Or, you know, you can do things like subtract, delete bodies. Yeah, that, I use the subtract probably more than the add, honestly, because you can mm -hmm. make a body that's really just like a tool, like a cutting tool, and then subtract it away. Absolutely. There was a good conversation about that in one of those live designs about making a manifold and doing it all as positive geometry, doing the subtract. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, good. Maybe before we go on, one other command to appreciate when you're navigating your solid bodies is delete keep body. So think about this way. If I'm in the assembly world, I can suppress any component at any time, right? If I'm in this world, can I right click and suppress a body? You mm. cannot suppress That's a body. The same way, no. I could suppress, let's say I want to get rid of those back to, I could suppress this, but guess what's going to happen? <laughs> Child features all go away too, right? So what if I want to get rid of these two? You have to use this command called delete, <coughs> excuse me, delete or keep body. And they added the keep option, what, 2015, which is great, because that's a lot of times your design intent is, I don't want to delete 9 out of 10. I want to keep one of them. But anyway, delete body, get rid of these two, delete the body, and now I'm left with two bodies, and it's a feature at the end. So this becomes a very important tool to use, especially at the end, to isolate what you want left. Uh, and in master model, it, it's very important especially if you use the, the techniques that Caleb showed, you've got to know how this works. But a lot of times, yeah, we'll use the keep command and say, hey, I've done all this work to get to this point of this is my final production body. Just keep that one. So now you can use that keep, that uh, delete or keep body feature like a, like a history. Um, yes. You can either sure. suppress it or roll back to it temporarily. Yeah, that's a great tip. Hey, and while we're going here, I know Brian's got a lot to cover, but uh, don't be shy about posting your questions yeah. in the chat, folks. Uh, I see some folks know, yeah. know, the, know the Weldman shortcut. Yeah, everybody of course, good. Be, be uh, okay. savvy on Weldman's. Hey, Raph, uh, um, commenting on, on our great fashion choices, obviously. Oh, naturally. Don't have the bow tie, but. And uh, yeah, question here from Jane is multi body. Uh, modeling part of uh, SolidWorks foundation application. Well, it's it's part of core SolidWorks. So whatever version of SolidWorks uh, you own, whether it be education license, commercial license, makers, this is yeah. core functionality. Uh, it's not uh, not something that you have to have a professional or premium package to get. And of course, last year we released uh, you know 3D Experience SolidWorks for makers, which gives you access to exactly what I'm using here, SolidWorks Connected. So quick sales pitch, nine ninety nine a month. Everything I'm going to show is in core SOLIDWORKS, except the end, I'm going to show you some simulation. Ooh, okay. um, so while, while you're measuring out your floor plan, this is one thing where I get, I get my wife to help me. I'm like, I want to measure it three times. She thinks I'm crazy, but I swear it'll be a little different every time you go around and measure the perimeter. And what are you measuring at? 
a lot of times I'm measuring in feet and inches or inches, but you guys know you can switch to feet and inches mm -hmm. in the length, and then you can change it to fractions. So if you think about how do you measure, uh, now in, in Imperial, this is one thing where millimeter and a millimeter tape measure, I kind of want to get one because it probably makes us a lot more precise, but I'm always like, ah, a little bit, that's a 30 second, you know? So you can use those types of units and you can round to the nearest fraction. Now, I typically don't put this in my part because when I measure it, no matter what I'm inputting, I want to put in as precise as possible. I don't want it to round it. But when I go to my drawing and what I'm displaying on my drawing, I would typically switch it to inches with 30 seconds and round to the nearest. But while you're designing, whatever you're inputting, you might have some decimal values. Don't put that on uh, and I'll keep it on inches. So anyway, so I do my site survey. I do my floor plan. We model some walls. Again, you guys got to watch Jordan uh, Tadich's. Um, he, he gives some great tips on making the floor plan. Now, Brad, here's the thing. I just did my walls, and where are my walls? You can kind of see them. Is that a graphics issue, or mm -hmm. like what's what's going on, brother? Well, I think the ghosting, it, my guess would be that they're hidden. Yeah. So the other thing to know about multi-body modeling is each body, just like in the assembly world, each part, each body can have different display state or different appearance, and you can uh, change their transparency. Or in this case, you can see the little silhouette outline, right? Here, if I can yeah. draw now this time with the mouse. That's right kind here, of cool. Right? How, show me again how you were hovering in the feature manager tree, right, over the feature, and it, it gives a ghosted preview there. Yeah? You like okay. that? Yeah. It's kind of nice. So again, just another reason to have your solid bodies there, folder there, have it expanded, and you can toggle hide and show. And then a few years ago, man, maybe this is like 16, 17 now, but you guys remember when we put in tab and shift tab in the assembly and that, now it's like, that's yeah. all I ever use. And then they added it the next year, two years after, it's all blurry now. Yeah. You can shift tab and tab at the multi-body part level. Multi-bodies, right, right. Can't live right. without that. How many of you in the chat are using, using tab to hide, shift tab to unhide? Yeah, I hope so. If not, um, that's a really good pro tip to take away today. But a lot of times you might freak out like, where's my thing? Where It's not in here. And again, just always watch your little display preview over here because you want to make sure if it's just hidden or not. So easy. I did my walls. I got my floor plan. And now I got to do my workbench. Okay, so where do you start? Uh, well, just like in my mock-up with tape, kind of the work level that I want to have my bench at, uh, I, I want it to be like super custom. Like I wanted it to be like the exact height so I could work here uh, and just have my, my hands right where I want them to be. So I made a plane that represented that height. So again, my references, as you guys can see, they're very simple. This is another reason why I'm in multi-body part. Uh, it's not like I'm putting in all these different components that I need to work around. Like Mike Sandy, when he built his, shell, his, his desk, he had some doors and cabinets and other things, monitors he wanted to model up. I'm not doing any of that. I just want to get my lumber, get it cut, slap this thing in. Um, so... Simple planes, simple extrudes, another reason I can stay in the multi-body part mode. So I think you guys all know how to make a plane easy enough. And I define that just by offsetting it from my floor. And that's one thing to think about. Jordan talks about this really well. When you're making your floor plan, try and get that dialed in. Uh, get all your cutouts if you're going to cut out windows or doors. And then start building off that. And kind of leave those behind and, and don't mess with them. So your face IDs aren't changing, your references aren't changing, because you're going to start sooner than later to reference those surfaces to, you know, offset from the floor or offset from the wall. So quick reference plane representing the top of my bench. And then, heck, why not just kind of work uh, top down? Although this is a different kind of, you know, top down, but literally vertical uh, downwards, just modeling the bench. Uh, so three quarter inch plywood doubled up, of course, because why not? And when we look at the weight of this thing, you guys are gonna think I'm crazy. But, you know, again, another reason I wanted to CAD this up, I don't really have enough experience, haven't really done a workbench like this. I don't know how stiff this is going to be. And I really want to minimize the deflection. So I'm like, okay, we'll double up on the three quarter inch plywood. Why not? Uh, so I started with that. And then I started thinking about, I want to put some storage cubbies in here. Another great use of multi-bodies. So mm -hmm. here, I'm like, ah, oh, this is cool because storage is, you know, one of the most important things. But look at this, Brad. I'm going to roll back in my feature tree. I have my three bodies we've talked about, the walls, the floor, the workbench. Look at this one feature. That's one feature. Seven bodies. So this is a – so SOLIDWORKS, I just – I love it so much because it's very forgiving. 
And the reason it's seven features is because it's a thin feature. So I just kind of sketched really rudimentary. You see, I'm like, oh, I, I measured all these storage bins we have. And I'm like, 16 inches, 20 inches. I want to make a little cubby, one sketch. And okay, then when you now, hold yeah. on, I got to stop you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are so many violations here, flagrant <laughs> violations. You know, you have uh, intersect Why? sketch geometry, you yeah. have uh, open contours, you have intersecting contours. Um, it's not fully defined. Um, oh, brother, come on. Breaking so many rules. Tell me what's it, the. It, it's, just, it's just a mock up. And so that's the thing. I didn't want to spend any more time other than I might want to put these, and I haven't built it yet, but I, I do want to build these storage cubbies. I, but again, that detail isn't important. I just need to see it. How is it going to look? How is it going to fit? And I did a simple extrude on that, but it was a thin wall. And so SolidWorks is so nice in that if you do a thin extrude, so a thin feature, right, where it just adds a thickness to your line segments, you uh, you can overlap them. And it'll realize that, and it'll actually force you to do a thin feature. Because obviously, with all those contours, they're overlapping you probably actually could not extrude this. Yeah, of all different the little, rules, different rules for different, different feature rules. types. So thin feature will enable you to really quickly mock up something like that. But anyway, I suppressed that because I haven't built it yet, but I kind of want to see what it would look like. Um, okay, so then I'm like, okay, great, Brian. You're, you're, you're almost done. And you can see there's actually a lot of features I had to add. I'm like, this looks good. I could start building, but I didn't know how to approach fastening this to the wall. I watched a lot of YouTube videos where other people did. Yeah. Uh, some people just built some ledger boards underneath. But again, you can't see my wall, but there's this flashing of concrete that never would have worked. So I'm like, I can't go horizontal. And like, I swear everyone on YouTube who does one of these builds, horizontal ledger board, horizontal ledger board, top and bottom. And it makes complete sense. But I'm like, ah, it's not going to work for me. I need to get something more... Uh, vertical. So I started messing around and there was a lot of deleted features I wish I would have kept here. But I was thinking, okay, what if I embrace the fact that there's almost like a paneling to this? Because again, they had these planks when they poured the concrete. So I have very smooth vertical sections, but they're discontinuous as I go along the wall. So let's just do something like this. And sorry, let me let's hide the wall. That's kind of annoying. What if I did vertical arms? And so I started modeling this thing up and I'm like, Two by sixes? Sure. Why not? Give them, give me a little bit of thickness, and you'll, you'll see why in a minute. And this is where you can really do some cool things to automate your workflow. So Jordan, in his workflow, he was doing a ton of framing. So he provided some templates that have predefined global variables for things like thickness. So think about it. If we're using two by, two by four, two by six, two by eight dimensional lumber, I'm going to be using one and a half inches a lot. So one of the things is you could do is you could set up uh, a variable called, you know, two by thickness and actually create that as a, as a variable. Mm. So it's got the little globe symbol next to it. Look at go. that. That's great. Right? Uh, and not like that's going to change anytime soon. I don't think, but it is nice to kind of set that and you're not going to fat finger that. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll have an arm coming out. And I did this in one sketch because I wanted to see what it, what it would look like. So we're going to have a multi-contour multi-body. And then it's kind of left an arbitrary length. And then I started to measure from the wall, like, where is this going to fit? Um, so pretty simple. And then when I extruded that, I used this select contour. So if I have two sketch contours, see, see this little guy, right? This little symbol. Always pay attention. Anyone who's new to SolidWorks, I know you're starting to appreciate this, but pay attention. Everything gives you a clue as to what's going on. Little hand, I guess that's a sharing hand, with a contour select. So you're sharing a sketch and you're using contour select, which means be careful if you edit the sketch. That's what it means to me, at least. And you might even make a comment on here and be like, uh, listen, don't change the contours. This is important. And of course, in 2023, we got some good capabilities to uh, enhance this. All right. So I made a little extrusion. Easy enough. I made another extrusion. This is where the sketch gets shared. Right. Okay, same Just, sketch for two different features. Yeah, shared great. sketch. Simple enough. Simple enough. And I saw this technique used on a few builds. And um, I'm like, that's, I don't know. It's two by six, but I'm going to double that up. Okay, so here's the thing. Notice how you can see hard lines between all the bodies. So this is where you got to be very diligent that 
when you do your extrude, keep that merge result off. If you turn it on, it's just going to add it to that workbench block. The next feature is going to start. It's going to be on by default, guys. That's just how it is. You got to make sure you deselect that, or it's going to you're going to mess up once or twice. And just remember, hey, double check merge result on off. It's off, so it's going to make a distinct body. So hey, every Brian, time, I have a question for you about that because you mentioned the yeah. the uh, the edges, the hard edges, as a good visual clue. What if you've got your shaded display option not to show the edges? Would would you still see that distinction? No, maybe. Let's try it. I never go into that mode. Um, uh, well, shaded without edges. Yeah. Ooh, the texture kind of gives it away. The texture gives it away, but yeah. So maybe that's something to keep in mind too when you're you want to look for those hard edges that you may need to set that. I like that. Shaded that stuff that's on. true. Okay, so you guys, I think are appreciating that. Anyone new to SolidWorks? I know. Again, this is stuff yeah. is half of you like this is so basic, and half of you like, oh my gosh, I just now I finally know merge. Yeah, and, I, and you know what, Jeff uh, is. Of course, leave it to one of our pros out here, Jeff Setzer. Make your model weldment. And yeah, we talked really, about that. We yep. did talk about that, but really, this is this is really exemplifying so, why that might be a good option to start with. Absolutely. You know. you know, the reason I don't, I didn't do it on this one. Uh, frankly, I wasn't thinking about it, but yeah, that would be absolutely right. When you start this, if you turn on weldment, well, Caleb said it well. He's like, I don't like it because it's not a weldment, so I don't want it in my tree. Yes, but it does then default that merge result checkbox off and it'll set you up for a cut list. So yeah, you could, you sh I should have turned that on, uh, but we'll do it at the end. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just being careful of that merge result off. And then I started thinking about, okay, this is good. And sorry guys, let me just hide this because I keep zooming and it kind of makes you seasick. Uh, great, there's a good start, but I need a little support arm here. I also, the other constraint I had at the bottom, uh, and you can't see it here, but on the bottom of here, it was it was a, there's a ton of concrete <laughs> that's coming out. And I started going on the whole, oh, I could grind that off. I could chip that off. I'm like, no, stop. You don't need to do that. Just maybe make this only as low as you can mount it uh, flush to the wall. But now I got to create a support arm. Uh, a couple ways to do that. But again, how do you want to how do you want to approach this? Well, what I really want to draw is a side profile and then extrude it out. Uh, the, the thickness. So this is a great tip. I don't know if you guys know how to do uh, reference planes. Well, I'm sure you do. But select two faces, and then you'll get a midplane. Boom. Love, Love the mid midplane, midplane. And then I just took that midplane. And, and, and I did that because I want to sketch the easiest place possible. Just boom, boom, boom to create little profile super simple All right nothing crazy there but again i kind of have this weird 55 degree angle and so my brain's already hurting thinking about wait what are the angles going to be on the miter saw 55 30 what's the complementary angle and the last thing i wanted to do is like mess up cutting a two by six uh, okay, so anyway, so that was my basic shape. And this is the final one that I, I, I landed on. There were some others I tried. Uh, but this I felt really, really good about. Right? And it's super beefy. I mean, this thing... Anyway, I'll show you guys the sim stuff. But uh, suffice to say, it is super beefy. And this is where I'm like, ah, I wish I was a better carpenter. Or I knew anything about, like, real carpentry joinery and all that. Because I don't. Because I'm thinking about, all right, just sink some fasteners into all this. Which is how I ended up doing it. Which created this whole challenge of like, okay, which fasteners do I put in when before I start covering things up? So I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but my whole premise was I'm going to take, I'm going to build five of these legs, slap them on the wall, put the top on, um, and it should all work work perfectly. And well, it kind of worked like that. But how am I going to attach it to the concrete? I was like, okay, Capcoms, uh, baby, six Tapcons. <laughs> Why not? Wow, six. Come on. I don't know quarter inch <laughs> but here's where whole wizard like i like a thousand pounds uh yeah yeah totally well as long as you don't over torque them that's the part i really messed up but you're now you're getting ahead of my story okay okay but I, I cranked a few too much and the head spins off and then you're just hosed like well i guess i'm drilling a new hole <laughs> um uh, yeah come to find out using your impact driver just slamming those things in is not the best way to drive a tapcon yeah it's so gratifying uh, you know hammer drill and the tapcon <laughs> and the and the, the impact driver oh that's so fun 
okay, so I'm I'm doing my whole wizard, and here's why I love whole wizard. I know everyone appreciates this, but it's like I don't yeah I don't have my tap cons yet. I don't at this point I don't know what fasteners I need to buy. I mean I have my random tubs of fasteners, but I'm like I'm gonna go buy really you know premium construction grade and and some good tap cons, uh, and this is where you can just go in and play around with well what looks right, and in the whole wizard you're actually specifying a fastener itself. I'm gonna have a countersunk fastener for a screw that's a quarter inch and of course whole wizard you're just going to put some um let's get positions let's just put some points in here yeah, put some dots it's on. it's going to figure out for you what the clearance hole is what the counter bore or in this case the counter sink is going to look like and how about that i'll put eight of them and then i just you know sketch this up so that whole is wizard looking, is yeah. that is looking like a cost overrun how was how <laughs> yeah. going on that uh i wasn't given a budget from the uh, household manager so i just kind of again i i just wanted to get it right the first time so i wasn't wasting especially with the wood so i sketch out a little pattern and if i want to make these equal i'm just going to control select my little diagonals set them equal so they're all uh, equidistant from each other and then of course we can do some window select always pay attention to your uh pop-up here oops i got the line in there Let's take all those points. Let's make them all vertically aligned. Clever. Right? Yeah. One thing as a new user, I hope we have a lot of new users watching this, and you just get comfortable with, you know, window selecting, but also this is the eyeball up here. Uh, notice I don't have any of my sketch relations shown, uh, which can kind of be surprising, and it's grayed out in this sketch. I don't know why. That's fine. Probably because you're in the middle of the command. Eh. See my guess. So nice. I specify quarter inch, and here's where I'm just like, ah, quarter inch, what about three eighths? Should I go bigger? Like, no, that looks crazy big. Uh, but again, I'm not messing with looking up the whole size. I'm just picking my fastener size, seeing how much I want. And then what depth am I going to do here? I don't know. Let's just do that. So I added uh, my mounting, and then I'm like, okay, there we go. Six, six of them. That'll be good. Now, how am I going to connect the rest of this stuff? So this is where I really played around with the whole wizard a lot. And I'll show you the next thing I want to do. And this will get me to my next lesson, which is feature scope, which is really important when you're in multi-body uh, modeling. So I'm thinking about, again, joining this to this. Joining, by that I mean cranking in some uh, construction screws. But again, what size do I want? How many can I fit in there? What depth should they be? By just using the whole wizard... I never even put fasteners in this model, by the way. By the time I got to like ordering stuff, I'm just like, hey, all I need is my whole table, and it's going to show me exactly what I what I need for fasteners because I drilled all these holes with the with the end in mind of like, okay, uh, number ten, three and a half inch. That looks that looks good. Hmm. So when you're in multi body, Brad, there's something that's really important, right? We already talked about the merge result option, feature scope, so important. Feature scope by default is going to be like all bodies or auto select. And really what I tend to do in multi-body to be very exact is I will always turn this to, I don't know how to erase that, but selected bodies. And I'm going to tell the software, hey, when you make this cut, when you make this extrude, extrude it should apply to these two bodies only. Okay, and that's really important, especially if you're using up to next or through all end conditions in multi-body, you could slice through way too much. So the feature scope is what's going to be impacted by this feature. Kind of a trivial case here. There's only two bodies, but I really wanted to make sure it was only going to go through those two. And so now I'm starting to validate my fastener placement. Like, yep, that's going to be okay. Ooh, let's add a little chamfer for style. Ah, eh, look at that. Mm. <laughs> Matching the angle. So I set that angle equal to my cut angle. Let's create a uh, cutout for the bottom. I can trim that puppy up. So it's looking pretty good. And then I was like, I want to see what this is going to look like with more of them. Is this going to look okay? Is it going to look crazy? I don't know. It looks okay. So I built this. I'm like, okay, this is pretty awesome. And by the way, I could probably fit a shelf under here. I don't know if you can see. Can you see? I actually did put a shelf in. And it's great because I can get more stuff off the floor. So I put a little plane in. Get another reference um, where I want to put that. Put in a little shelf. Again, super simple, just a, a one by 12, easy enough. And here was a great challenge, which was like, okay, actually, sorry, let me get to it. But I want to talk about the clearance cut for these. Uh, shelf, easy enough. Now I want to copy it over to the other side. 
Now, this is where, again, if you're doing more of these or moving more around or wanting to use mating commands, move copy body is, it gives you mate commands, but you got to do them one at a time. Uh, so, for example, let me just show you this. So, I want to copy this and make three of them at 90 degrees for the other wall, my east wall over here. Okay, let's move copy body. And, again, select the bodies that I want to move and copy. Those guys, great. And I love this because you can do one or the other. You can mate them to something or you can translate rotate. So what I first did was rotate these things 90 degrees around the Y axis. All right. To kind of put it in place. Uh and not uh, move them, but copy them. So I copied it. Mm -hmm. And then I used the other option to constrain it back to this wall. And I did a pattern there. So very, very simple patterning. Another reason I might go to an assembly versus a multi-body could be I want to use more sophisticated patterning, uh, feature-driven patterning, curve-driven patterning, any of this stuff that's just not basic linear patternings. You might want to do that. Okay, so this is looking pretty good, but I got a lot more fasteners I need to uh, put in. And then I want to talk about this real quick because I almost made a huge mistake doing this. So I'm, I'm doing this project. I love the shelf. It's looking good. I made some clearance cuts. So I'm thinking, oh, this will be slick, right, Brad? You just, Ooh, I'll put yeah. a little clearance cut and then I won't even need fasteners. I can just slide this shelf in. And I was thinking, oh, man, this is going to be so easy to do. I'll just set this thing up uh, on my table. I'll, I'll clamp it down. I'll use my router uh, to, to cut this. And I all, when I was cutting these, I almost cut them while the pieces were just in the in the wild, if you will. And I something said, no, wait, you should not do that yet. Because by the time you assemble it, what are the chances yeah. that all these cuts are going to line up? And I'm sure this is kind of obvious to some of you. Like, yeah, dude, like some things you do in CAD and you don't do at the part level, you know, you do it at the assembly level. And I'm really glad I did that. So I ended up mounting everything to the wall, setting it all up, and then coming back, even though it was a real pain in the ass, and I routered out these shelf holes um, after they were all mounted with a laser level. And they were definitely not the same position as they were as a raw part, if that makes sense. So yeah. when you're doing a project, you really got to think, A, again, how much detail do I want to put in CAD? Because B, two, how much do I want to do to each part? prior to assembly and then what should i do after i assemble as an assembly level feature uh if you will so just something interesting that i almost messed up and that would have been terrible i would have got this whole thing mounted and then had these super wonky slots cut in uh again just because the wall is not that not that level and my all my woodworking is probably not that great uh, so again moving on and we're gonna get, run short on time i put in some ledger boards and ultimately scrap those because you guys are probably already thinking like, that's crazy. Yeah, you def <laughs> I definitely did not need that. So here's where I really used Whole Wizard to figure out what I was going to do in the order in which I was going to do it. So let's look at these. How am I going to attach this 55 degrees to these arm tops? Fasteners, 4-inch deck screws, 3 16 which I did. And what, was, what I made a little note for myself in my feature, leave for assembly. So when I cut it, I remembered um, I actually didn't screw those in until I had the arms mounted because then I could wiggle it a little bit up and down to get each arm level. And mm -hmm. then I kind of sunk in these fasteners to connect the top to the arm so I can move it yeah, back and forth a little bit. Brian, I'm really curious. How, how did you ensure, since you didn't use a ledger board to set the, the workbench surface on, you know, that'd be the easiest way to establish level. You've got these individual cantilevers. How did yeah. you ensure where the level was? Yeah, I mean, when I installed it, it was literally like this. Oops. Yeah. Back. Let's hide you. Yeah, I, I made. And I wish I had a picture of this because it was it was pretty cool. It had a stack of these five giant, like fifty pound hunks of two by six. And honestly, I just I, I put up a laser level over here. Okay. Put the level where I wanted it. I mounted the first one, measured it, made sure it was level. Um, but yeah, you know what took forever, and you guys can probably imagine was drilling the holes for the Tapcon, uh, because I ended up getting, yeah, three and a quarter inch 
which means you need to drill two and a half inches, I think I did, into the concrete. And you know what? Those bits, Those actually bits. I had to go back to the depot twice just to get new concrete bits. Like this this stuff, let's see, it's 70-year-old concrete. And what do they say? It hardens the more as it ages. I'm like, oh, man. That took probably half a day just to drill all those holes. I mean, I'm just sitting here, with the hammer drill. And that's where having the right tool, you mentioned Harbor Freight. Like, yeah, but that probably would have burned out that hammer drill. Uh, I liked I, I liked having the Milwaukee. Like, that's when you want a tool that's going to last. When you're doing half a day with the same drill uh, and you really want it to last and not burn out, that was, that was key. So I mounted all those, kept them level. Then I put the top on. But before I get to that, let me show you this. Uh, how I finished up the hole wizard. But again, this was great. I could kind of visualize the holes and the fasteners I was going to use. I did some more fasteners back here. Some more fasteners to join these together. And by the time I got done, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, another set of fasteners to go upwards that's going to hold the top. And then these fasteners. So A, and I won't have time to make a whole table, but you guys can think if you make a whole table on a drawing and it shows you the whole types, I had a good list then of all the fasteners that I needed just from this. But now I'm thinking, oh man, this is crazy. Like, how am I going to drill all these and keep it all straight? And so that's when I realized I really need to create uh, a template. So let me let me jump to that, Brad, and yeah. let me make a yeah, drawing. That. I think that's really, that was a really fun part of this, was getting to this point. And so this, now that you guys have seen the model, this is the back of one of those arms and you, you probably already see there's construction lines for all the different fasteners and it's almost like an x-ray of a surgery trying to fit all the pins in but i used th so then i ended up oh i mentioned drilling into the wall i ended up using this i put this around where my laser level was to drill my uh my tapcon holes and then i also used it to drill into the uh the wood and i have another one of these somewhere that's the top of each of these pieces. So making a one-to-one -one template became a pretty important task. So let's make a drawing real fast. And uh, we'll talk about the, the making a drawing of a multi-body. Always a, a favorite topic. <clears throat> so I don't really care the scale on this. I'll show you how I ended up making the one-to-one -one template, but let's just bring in a new model view and when you have a multi-body part, one of the most important options is to select bodies. Now, one thing you could do is, you know, there's a variety of methods to like insert into new part uh, or save bodies, and you could split them into parts. And a lot of people do that because it makes detailing easier uh, and more robust. For me, I'm just like, I can use select bodies. So select bodies, <clears throat> excuse me, lets you go in and create a drawing of just the bodies that you select. So it actually took me back into 3D to pick the scope. Super nice, right? So let's make a top view of this. And I have no idea which template I selected. So let's go down to my bottom right. Sheet scale, I went one-to-one. -one. Okay. Uh, good. Let's make a whole table real quick for reference. I mentioned that a few times. Pick our reference axes. Oh, and I might call out dot text. There we go. Anyway, that's a good one. But that'll list my holes for me, and I can understand which one is which. More importantly, I want to print this out as a as a one to one. And of course, I don't have a F size. I don't even know what what size paper this is. So what I want to do is print this out uh, in a way that I can actually get it to print on my my uh, printer. So let's do this. Let's, first of all, get rid of the... Yep, get rid of the border and the, delete the border sheet format. My table. How do I get rid of this down here? Edit sheet format? Or just hide hide it from the list? No? Delete. Oh, look at there. Okay. Right. Edit sheet format. Okay. And then, actually, what I really want to do is, how do I change this? Edit sheet format. How do I change this to a letter size? I should have thought about that beforehand. How do I change my paper size? Do you know how to do that? I want to say it's in the sheet properties. Uh, edit sheet format, properties. Oh, look at you. Okay. 
So we want inches. Why is it not giving me inches? Is it because it's my document properties? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's set up our properties. And this is where I was talking earlier about units and fractions and, and rounding to and all that. Yeah. I want my length to be in inches and I want to have fractions to the 32nd. And no matter what anything is, round it to the nearest one for me. So when I'm doing the drawings for these, do this. And then even if it's not exactly a 32nd, it'll round it because that's as far as I'm going to be able to measure it. Uh, yeah, important point probably for any newer users here is that the units and setup for a drawing document are different than the units or can be different than the units for an assembly or a part because they're different documents, they're different files. So uh, don't just point. assume that they're going to carry over. Okay, so here's like, and I thought about this for a little bit. I'm like, well, this is going to be tough. I'm going to print this, but this is what I ended up with so I can make my little template. Uh, take the sheet. We'll just copy it and paste it. And this one is pretty easy. And then I just made a second one like so. And actually, I did it like this. Now I'm thinking through this because how do you know how to line them up? So I did this. I made three pieces for one drawing view. So then I did this. And the reason I did it this way is because then I can pr I can print. This will be page one. I'll print it. Page two and page three. And each one I can overlap a little bit with the previous one because you can just see underneath. I can see the center marks for all my holes and tape it together. Whatever. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so print, a, print that's this. That's a really on the fly. That's it, buddy. PDF, and then just be very, 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 very careful, especially if you go to PDF first, that you don't have any scaling set up. So whether it's in probably here in the page setup, you know, are you scaling to fit? I do not want to scale to fit, which a lot of times is on by default, 100%. Of course, it's not going to fit letter size, like triple check this. And then when I actually printed out, my three pieces assembled it. You no know, gut check, took some of those measurements uh, on there. Anyway, so that's how I made the little template. And yeah, you know, it, it turned out pretty well. Again, I, I would love to be a better or a carpenter at all because I'm sure there's really, really nice ways to join these that aren't just slamming in a bunch of fasteners. But hey, uh, this got it done. And I was able to do this in uh, it was more than a day. I think it was probably like three days by the time I was done as a side trip, but it, uh, it worked out. Mm -hmm. what um, do you think your CAD time to actual work time was and, and how oh, much time maybe did you save because of the CAD time? I saved so much time because I did this in CAD. So again, we go back to this original idea of, I really was just about to, you know, no time for CAD, just take some wood and start drilling it in. Cause again, how hard could it be? And I, I went through a lot of iterations. I didn't even show you guys of just design. What does it look like? I mean, one of the most important things to me is like my shop looks good and it's inviting. One of the ways you can validate that is do a walk through. Let's add a new walk through, which will give you kind of a perspective here of what this is going to look like from um, a human standpoint. With the 2011, right... I want to say. I don't even remember. I bet there's some. There's some folks in the chat that can confirm that, but it goes yeah. back a ways. So this is what I ended up with, but it, the other designs I had were very, very ugly. But I so I probably spent four hours in CAD mocking this. So instead of when I was just going to start mounting stuff, I was like four hours, half a day in CAD and got to this point. And again, it saved me a ton of time because I got the templates printed out. Um, I was able to quickly assemble how much lumber I needed. And in fact, I didn't even make a cut list. All I did was use that little trick where you kind of see select an edge. And you see down there, 2.4 feet. So I'm like, I need 2.4 feet plus 2 feet. Uh, that's about a 6-footer times 5, 30 feet. So 5, 6-footers plus these. I just kind of tallied this up. I ended up getting like 10 2 by 6s. <laughs> um, so it was really nice to be able to 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 do that and just to visualize what this was going to look like. So I did spend half a day in CAD, but it probably saved me from having a super hideous <laughs> design that I hadn't really thought through, especially when it came time to like, okay, how do you assemble all this in the right order? You know, these fasteners have to go in first. 
then these fast, then put it on the wall, then put in these fasteners, then put these up. So, hey, I, I know I just have a couple minutes, but I, I do want to show some simulation because I thought this was really a cool part of why we want to do CAD and and why, honestly, you could use things like SketchUp for this, right? I mean, they don't have the whole wizard, which was a big part of this, but you really, as an engineer, as a designer, want to be able to have some some validation of your design. Uh, so do you think we have five minutes? We can do some sim. Or is there other questions in the chat we should cover? No, chat's chat's looking looking good. They're tracking right along with you, Brian. And uh, good, I good. think we'd, I think we'd love to see a little bit of sim to, sim to find out. Uh, you know, my gut tells me that everybody in the chat could come to your house and we could probably stand on this thing it's mm. gonna, with all the tap cons. But let's let's get go. some validation. Yeah, actually, I did end up sitting on this thing, and it. Did. My mic will stop me here. I uh, it doesn't even move like a mil. It doesn't even move a millimeter. It is so overbuilt, which is exactly what you want with a nice workbench, so you can actually clamp things, you know, work on here, just put all the tools up that you need, and just not have to worry about anything. Okay, so multi body we talked about in the very very beginning as a key tool. You remember delete keep body. So before I do anything downstream, let's clean up all the reference stuff. And instead of selecting all the stuff to delete, let's select just what we want to take into our simulation or to the downstream. So I ledger boards, I never did that. And let's ignore these vertical or these horizontal shelves. That's only gonna add some lateral yeah, just to uh, add some stiffness. stiffness. Mm -hmm. So let's just select only what we want to keep, keep bodies. I just, I love that option. I know you all do too. And then I'm left with just all these. And you see, here's why we talk about naming bodies, but look at my tree. You see how a lot of these got renamed from the feature? So a lot of times I, you wait to the very end and then name these when you're kind of at the end of that, that modeling cycle. All right, so let's go to simulation and start a new study. So this is where SolidWorks Premium, you need premium to run linear statics or a simulation license. But here's one reason I love simulation. A, it's just integrated. Like I just started a simulation right inside SolidWorks. And then it, it also recognizes multi-body. It says, oh, great. You have all these different bodies. So it, it really to simulation, it treats a multi-body part in an assembly exactly the same. It's just multiple solid uh, volumes. Uh, so let's a apply a material. And I'm on my laptop, so I guarantee I don't have my material database with my wood properties oh maybe i do have one here we go i have a douglas fir <laughs> i did not buy fur for this but we'll just apply that and by default everything is going to stick together do you guys all know component interaction global interaction is bonded now if you think about that that's a pretty non-conservative assumption to assume that everything is perfectly glued and bonded together like almost like they're welded through the thickness because they're not. They're actually pushed together. I didn't even glue these, honestly, because I was so afraid I'm going to have to take it apart that something wasn't going to work. Uh, but again, it didn't really matter in the end, but there's fasteners. So when you do a simulation, you really got to think about, do I want to just assume these are glued uh, or do I want to make them a friction contact, what we call you know contact situation, and do, fa and do fasteners? So when I did this, I'm like, we can assume everything is, is glued and rigid for first first pass, and then we can always add more detail. So let's just keep it simple. It's basically gonna treat this as one giant hunk of wood. So how are we gonna load this? Well, let's do some fixtures. And the first pass on this analysis, I'm just gonna say, fix these back walls. And anyone who's been in simulation a while, you've probably heard us talk about the crawl, walk, run approach. And this is this in action, it's like, Super simple, clamp the back, treat it all bonded, and then we can add in more details after we know that this is this uh, study is going to work. Gravity, well, that's the wrong plane. Gravity pointing down for our dead load. For our active load, I mean, I don't know. Let's see. How much, how much poundage do you think this workbench should be able to hold up to? Let's see if I sat on it, a couple friends, put on some tools... I don't know, 2,000 pounds? I mean, that's as most as this thing is ever going to see ever times two, right? And everything's going to scale anyway. So, yeah, linear static. OK. 
Okay, so now we actually have enough to run it. We have material properties. We have um, the stiffness for that. We have restraints. We have force. Let's see if we can mesh this. And again, I'll just keep it simple. First uh, pass, default mesh. Is, you know, maybe I'll have to tighten the mesh up, but just keep the defaults. It's going to pick a mesh size for you. And if you're new to FEA, this is really exciting. This is where the mesh, it takes your continuous geometry from SolidWorks, breaks it into tetrahedrons, mm -hmm. and that allows it to create a mesh and network where each tetrahedron has different stiffness and it's applying the force and it's flowing through the system and we'll be able to see what the deformation is what the stress is going to be uh for me it was really about displacement like i wasn't really worried about the wood failing i mean look at this thing it's more robust than like my roof framing um but two things one deflection uh and then two the fastener uh factor of safety and you can see it failed. And when you zoom in, you'll see why. Because the default size, ooh, probably didn't capture a lot of those holes. Yeah. So this is where you can go back. We could simplify the model. But, you know, when you're going really fast, what I like to do, let's just crank this thing up. Crank it up. Yeah. Crank it up. So that's a really cool thing about the mesher in SolidWorks simulation, too, is that it really does a good job of anticipating what to do around those, like those small cutouts. You know, when I first saw you put those in, I thought, oh, boy, that's going to that's really going to throw off the uh, the simulation. But all those small features, it just kind of knows how to adjust itself to uh, to accommodate those well, little pieces of geometry, right? Yeah, the new the default measure now is the curvature or, or advanced curvature based. And curvature based was, was a really big enhancement because it would take a look at anything that's circular or had an arc to it and try and mesh around that first mm -hmm. and foremost and then build from there. So with like everything we do, there's a variety of levels of, of detail, of sizes of geometry you want to capture. Uh, so, yeah, the curvature-based measure is is fantastic. So you can see here that in action. It just wow. refined itself. All right. Pretty good. Again, for a first pass, let's do it. We can always refine it, add more boundary conditions, add more interactions, add more mesh. But let's just get a real quick look at what There's the... There's no way you can run this. We've, we've only got a couple minutes left, Brian. We got oh, yeah. You are you seriously going to run this? Yeah, this will solve. So when you're thinking about solve time, this is where the trade-off between, hey, assume everything is bonded and glued together versus, no, I want to put in some fasteners. I want to see the contact force between things. When you don't have any of those contact conditions, right, where you're having things slide or move, everything's glued together, it's actually pretty easy. Well, I couldn't do it, but... It's pretty straightforward because it's one stiffness matrix. It's all constant, right? It's not iterating as it discovers the friction and the normal force between the components. So let's just take a second. Hey, actually, while it solves, Brad, mm -hmm. you, I know you're kind of pushing me to wrap up. I did want to mention this again because we talked about this in the very beginning. We had a lot of folks join in. I want to mention that today's episode is really meant to be the first episode in a playlist that we'll post uh, Ian will post that. We'll put it in the description. Today is re was really about a primer to multi-body modeling. So we went through some real fundamentals, the solid bodies folder, merge result, feature scope, move copy bodies, hide and show, delete and copy body, some real fundamentals. Because as you watch the rest of these videos, um, it kind of relies on you understanding what those are. So if you're new, great. This is going to be, this was a, hopefully a good place to start. But this is the watch order that I'd recommend uh, for for this topic. And if you get all the way through, you're going to have a really good perspective on what's multi-body and then how can I use it in my product design, whether it's going to be master modeling or in context. So really want to shout out to the team for putting together uh, over the last couple of years some really good episodes. And of course, Caleb from the community joining us a few weeks back and having one of the highest viewed already um, shows on his on master modeling. So definitely, definitely check that out. Yeah. Yeah. And I see uh, we've got that that playlist already posted here in the chat. Wow. Oh, that looks Whoa. amazing. Look at that. It's like, uh, am I, am I, what's in my nog? Okay. I, so the first thing when you look at sim, uh, deformation scale is 1200. That's a scaling issue there, right? Yeah. Let's, let's look at displacement. And one of the things I like to do, especially on a demo or, uh, you know, a consult, let's just go ahead and make this a true scale deflection although it's good to see this because it's your gut check hey is everything glued is this what you would expect magnified a thousand times to see 
you know, kind of the interstitial pieces here. Deflect? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's good. But let's go true scale inches and see what the stiffness is of this system. And look at that. I don't know if you guys can see that. We're in the 10, like 1,000th Thousands, of yeah. an inch. Let's go floating point. Point. There we go. The max displacement is like 10 thou. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. What about a factor of safety? That That's maybe more a little... A uh, little in line with you can you can make a factor safety plot, but you got to think about what's your allowable with wood. Yeah, uh, you know that that's a little bit nebulous because with the grain or against the yep. grain, you'd have to make some assumptions. Now, a lot of my force is in the uh, with grain direction, but frankly, it oh man, I mean it's it's so, can so we get high. Useful out of that, do you think for, for what, what I got is six point nine? But again, I I I I'd have to go back and see what my what I put in for my allowable. But mm. I mean six point nine and the lowest factor of safety. Um, let's see where that is. Let's turn on some options, chart options. Let's show our minimum flag. And as to be expected, it's probably right where. You have a completely rigid fixture. We clamp that, if you remember, and then it can flow here, which is not accurate. And again, so how do we add more detail to this? We've had a lot of good simulation lab designs, but what you really want to do is create what we call a virtual wall. Now, the virtual wall, I can then put in virtual fasteners, and what I ended up doing was doing that because then I could get the fastener force. Mm -hmm. So think of it this way. Anywhere that you have a clamp or you're telling SOLIDWORKS zero deformation, you can pull out resultant forces. So if I would have fixed it or adhered it with like a fastener, or if I would use the fastener holes, let's take a look at how much force is flowing through this fixture here. And let's do it in inches. Okay, it's actually not that bad. But so for this whole face here, I have a down, a shear force of 442 pounds. Mm -hmm. And an outward force of 178. Now that's in bending. So again, it's not as accurate. But first of all, how is that going to be distributed amongst the fasteners? I have six fasteners, 442 pounds of shear. Uh, I don't know what the allowable is offhand for those quarter inch tapcons, but I'm pretty sure it's in the thousands of pounds. So by the time you, you, know, you, you do this, I felt pretty good. But that's another thing. When you're thinking about sim, deflection, yes. Factor safety, yes. But a lot of times you just want the result force or the fastener force, right? That's your main failure point. And when you look at a design like this, yeah, it's those tap cons on the wall that could shear or pull out. Um, that's not the case here. Again, the most dangerous thing for this design was me installing those things and like over torquing them with the uh, with the driver. <laughs> so, yeah, you can keep adding detail to this. But alas, I know we're out of, out of time. It's it's looking really good, though, Brian, and I think Jeff has confirmed um, that it's all blue, looks good, and, <laughs> and uh, 6.9 factor safety. We've got Jeff sign up on this. so Oh, Setzer? Hey, buddy. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff is always always here and always uh, lending his we, we should have We should have Jeff, Jeff come on and do a live design. I, you know, I'd love to hear from more people. Um, what was super interesting about multi-body mm -hmm. or master modeling and I kind of lump it together because you usually use it in that context. But you watch these five videos. We all have a different take on it. Everyone has a different take. Jeff, I'm sure, would have a good take. Every one of you out there who's used multi-body, I would love to hear how you use it to the best uh, extent. Because there are a lot of workflows and no one right answer. We keep saying that. A lot of really good ways to get there. But hopefully today, you know, we help give some perspective and hopefully some fundamental understanding of what yeah. multi-body is and how it works so you can go maybe rewatch some of these episodes and yeah, save Jordan's for last because that, that that's, video, Brad, you remember that one? That's a big kid project. It's like a master class yeah, yeah. in one hour and 15 minutes. So we'll have to you have know, Jordan think, back for a part um, two. So we got a lot of really good modeling tips too, but I, I'm just really inspired to, to do some projects like, um, you what know, are you gonna a few do? weeks ago, I did I did some flooring in in my safe room that's right over here. We it's it's kind of a gym slash safe room, and I used CAD to just mock up the the flooring layout. And you know, it helped me with the estimation. I got the materials estimated perfectly. I was able to mock up a couple of different layout options so that it went in right the first time. And that was just a real simple project. But uh, 
I, I really like your point about knowing when to yeah. when to use CAD and even better yet, when to get out of CAD and actually just start the process. So well, uh, this, I know I'm inspired and hopefully there's yeah. some of you yep. here that uh, that have found some inspiration too to uh, not only learn something new or maybe try a new feature, but to also uh, see how you can integrate that into into some kind of home project. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Brian, that was really awesome. This is this Thanks, is going to be one I want to go back and and rewatch for some of those nuggets. And for everybody in the chat, um, some things to keep in mind: uh, 3D Experience World is coming up in my hometown here in Nashville in yes. February. So make sure that uh, you can attend that both virtually or in person. Uh, I think we'll get the the links uh, coming up in there in the chat for 3D Experience World registration. Make sure to subscribe, obviously, to um, to the SolidWorks YouTube channel, and that's where you're going to get up to date information on all of our latest content, as well as the many different types of live streams we have. We have live design, like you just saw here. We have SolidWorks Live, great episode that aired yesterday, kind of a year in review of uh, of SolidWorks Live. And then next week we have not a live design episode, but we have manufacturing live coming up, which is going to yes. be a great. Yes. recap of 2022 as well as a look to what next year's programming is going to look like as well so make sure you're subscribing so you're notified about uh, all those episodes so that's coming up on the 13th so lots of great stuff happening uh in um in the solidworks live streaming uh channel um thanks again to brian for the great content thanks to everyone who joined us in the chat and uh Hey, join us in another episode, and uh, if you do happen to make it to 3D Experience World, make sure you track uh, track all of these guests down who've been on uh, these live episodes and, and get to know us all in person. We'd love to say hey. All right, Brian, any parting uh, parting words? I can't wait. It's two, I was looking at the calendar, two months, less than two months to Nashville, so uh, we got to figure out some presentations, but I can't wait to see folks there. Otherwise, happy holidays, and thanks, Brad, for spending some time in your shop and my shop. And I wish you had, <laughs> we do this all day, but I guess we got to go back to our real jobs now. This is so much fun. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody.